All right, and so begins our unit on biodiversity and classification. And uh, you'll notice we're looking at a screen here or, or a slide that has no figures, no images, and that's unusual for me because I feel strongly that every slide should have at least one graphic or image or diagram or something on it to make it more interesting than just a bunch of words. But what this slide is is basically a placeholder because the biodiversity part of this unit you're going to learn through a project. And the project is known as the LAME Presentation Enhancement Project. You'll be supplied slides and you will be asked to enhance those slides because the slides have nothing but words on them, nothing but written information. And so you're going to enhance those slides by adding images to make the slides more um, meaningful and learning about biodiversity in the process, a very important topic. Because as you probably know, one of the major problems on Earth is that we're losing biodiversity every day. Species are going extinct. And it's because of human activity and, and human population growth. Now let's get into the classification part. And uh, just starting off here, it, it's related to biodiversity. I mean, the whole reason we classify is because there's so much biodiversity on the planet. We want to learn about it and organize it to be able to learn about it. Um, but the first point here is to remind you that life has been evolving for about 4 billion years. We think that life arose on the planet about 4 billion years ago, and that began with bacteria, which ruled the earth for about 2 billion years, and then eukaryotes evolved, but eukaryotes were unicellular for about a billion and a half years, and then they uh, evolved to become multicellular, and you know those are the organisms that we know best now is because they're they're larger multicellular organisms are visible with the naked eye they're not microscopic like bacteria and, and protists the one-celled eukaryotes so the idea here is that these species have been evolving all the species on the planet have been evolving for five for four billion years basically and there's a reminder here that uh Evolution involves the, you know, more than just natural selection. It says natural selection here, but if you'll recall, natural selection is only one of the five fingers of evolution that you learned about in that Ed Puzzle video that I assigned in the last unit for microevolution. Um, so besides natural selection, there's that concept of genetic drift, just random changes in allele frequency, right? Because that's what microevolution is, is changes in allele frequency. So genetic drift is one gene flow referring to migration either into or out of a population will change the allele frequency non-random mating will change the allele frequency so like sexual selection is an example of non-random mating where the female chooses the male and then of course mutation will change the uh, allele frequency in a population you know instantaneously uh, a gene will mutate and turn into a different kind of gene, a different kind of allele, and of course that is going to change the allele frequency. So these are the five forces that have been identified to cause species to change over time and species to evolve over time, and it's resulted in, like it says here, a staggering diversity of organisms, and that's what this figure is supposed to represent, this picture of uh, mostly mollusks. Now we also have a sea star here, which is a, a different phylum altogether. Mollusks are in the phylum Mollusca, and sea stars are in the phylum Echinodermata, but almost everything, or all the other ones besides the sea star, um, are mollusk shells, and, and it does, it is a great representation of all the different kinds of mollusks um, representing diversity, differences between species. And biologists have described about a, a billion, or I'm sorry, a million and a half species. Only a million and a half. Now that's a million and a half. That seems like a pretty big number. But when you compare it to the estimated number of species on the planet, that's just a drop in the bucket, basically. Because it's estimated that the total number of species, and we're only talking about eukaryotic species, is about 8.7 million. So just completely ignoring prokaryotes which there are uh, you know, countless millions more um, species of, eu of prokaryotes, just eukaryotes only, it's estimated there are about 8.7 million species. And of course, some of them are on the land and some are in the water. And it's been determined or estimated anyway, that there are about 6.5 million of the 8.7 million on land, terrestrial, 
and about 2.2 million in the oceans. Now, why would that be? Well, the ocean is, is a water, it's an aquatic habitat, and aquatic habitats tend to be more stable. Um, there are a lot more niches on land. So there are a lot more terrestrial niches, therefore there are a lot more terrestrial species. That's the idea. Um, so the more niches there are, the more species there will be, because species will evolve to fill niches. If there are available niches, then species will evolve to fill them. And that the reason we have so many species is because there are so many available niches. And if you'll recall, a niche simply refers to a way of making a living. So if, if there's a way to make a living, life will find a way to make a living that way. So why this discrepancy? It's estimated there are 8.7 million. We've only found 1.5 million. Well, that's because there are so doggone many of them. Um, you know, it's difficult to find them all. And many of them are in places that are difficult to reach, like on the bottom of the ocean or deep in the Earth's crust even. And even, even multicellular eukaryotes can be really small, can be microscopic. So a, a lot of them are really small. So the goal, of course, is to find and classify all the 8.7 million species. Um, so that's the, the primary goal of the current biological classification system is to find them, name them, describe them, so that other people, when they find them again, know that they found a species that's already been uh, discovered and named. And, and also to group them in, in a logical way, to organize them in a logical way so that it's, that it's easy to communicate about them and study them. And that's a huge undertaking, as you can imagine. Um, and the problem is that not too many people are now going into taxonomy, which is the class, you know, the study of classification and the work of classifying all these species. Um, so it's a, it's a wide open field if you want to go into taxonomy because we need more taxonomists to carry, you know, to be able to find all these species and classify them. Um, so how do we classify them? Well, we base classification on evolutionary relationship. So the classification system that we now use, the biological classification system, the, the logical organized uh, way that we organize all the species that we uh, have discovered and are discovering is evolutionary relationship also known as phylogeny. And so there's a vocabulary word, and we've, I've used the term phylogeny before, but phylogeny refers to evolutionary relationships. So why classify? Well, this slide is all about getting across the idea that I've already tried to get across to you. I mean, we're, we've been talking about 8.7 million and all that. Um, there are a lot of species on the planet, and if we're going to study them, we need to be able to communicate about them, and we need to be able to classify them to be able to communicate about them. So this is just another demonstration of how many species there are on this planet. Um, so what we're looking at here is a phylogenetic tree. And a lot of times phylogenetic trees look like trees. That's when they don't have a whole lot of uh, organisms on them, a whole lot of branches on them. But if you're going to represent a phylogenetic tree with a lot of branches and a lot of species, you need to make it into a circle like this. And so a lot of phylogenetic trees are now being represented in, circular, in, in this circular arrangement. Um, but anyway, my question for you here is, what is this a phylogenetic tree of? In other words, what organisms are represented here? Does this represent all life on Earth? Does it represent only uh, prokaryotes? Does it represent only eukaryotes? Does it represent only vertebrates or only invertebrates or only uh, <clears throat> dinosaurs, you know? So, well, one clue is what's right here. It says, you are here. And uh, I want to show you what this thing really is um, by zooming in on it here. So I'm going to uh, get out of the presentation. And I've got this as a PDF file. Um, and you'll notice that I've zoomed in a bit onto the UR here. So now you can at least read UR here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in more so you can see. But you'll notice that along the edge here, it's kind of jagged. It's not smooth. So I want to show you what those jagged things are. And as I zoom in here, it's probably going to become uh, apparent to you what those what that fuzzy edge really is. So zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, trying to keep it so you can see. And now I'm sure you can see what they really are. 
Species names. Scientific names of species, including us. And they are so fine that I wasn't even able to get the pointer line pointing exactly to us. Um, but here we are, Homo sapiens, along with our great ape relatives, gorillas, pan paniscus, or bonobos. So we are most closely related to gorillas and bonobos. Uh, chimpanzees are pan troglodytes. So you, you, you know, you've been hearing that we are closely related to chimpanzees, but we are actually more closely related to bonobos, which are uh, similar to chimpanzees, but also, uh, well, a different species in the same genus, though, pan. Um, so that's what this really is. So what is it? It's a phylogenetic tree. I'm going to go ahead and close it, get back into our presentation here. It's a phylogenetic tree of all mammals, just mammals, thousands and thousands of species of mammals. So that's just another uh, demonstration of what, uh, what we're up against here <clears throat> and what taxonomists have done with the species that have been discovered. <clears throat> and all these branches here in this phylogenetic tree represent evolutionary relationships. You know, the closer species are uh, on, the, on the tree, the clo more closely related they are uh, to each other. And we're working on this, uh, both extant and extinct species. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, it's, it's practically impossible that we'll ever find every single species on the planet. But you can imagine it's even more impossible that we're, we'll ever find every species that has ever lived on the planet, all the extinct species, because 99% of all species that are, have ever lived are now extinct. So the, the, the 8.7 million species, eukaryotic species that are on the earth now are only the living species. There are 99% more that, that are now extinct. So it, it's totally impossible that we'll ever find and classify all of them unless some new biotechnology is, is created that somehow miraculously is able to read out all the species that have ever lived from the existing DNA on the planet, which is possible, but probably not likely. So as I mentioned, this is the work of taxonomists. So this is biological taxonomy, and taxonomy means arrangement method. So this is simply a method of arranging all the species that have been discovered. So it's naming, describing, or defining, and then classifying the organisms based on these things that we call synapomorphies. Shared, and they're also known as shared derived characters. So these are one and the same. Shared derived characters, synapomorphies are the same thing. Um, and we're going to go ahead and define synapomorphy here. And literally translated, it's together shape. Morph refers to shape to, and syn <clears throat> Synap refers to together. Um, so these are characteristics that species share together. That's the idea. So we're talking about homologous characteristics that are present in an ancestral species and shared exclusively, possibly modified, however, by its evolutionary descendants. An example of that would be a backbone, a vertebral column, all vertebrates, have a backbone. All vertebrates have a vertebral column. The vertebral column, the backbone in all vertebrates is a homologous structure that is shared um, along with the ancestor that ha was the first to have a backbone. So that's, an idea, that's the idea of a synapomorphy. So all vertebrates are related to each other and we know that because they all have a backbone. That's their synapomorphy and they all uh, have a backbone because they had an ancestor that had a backbone. That's the shared character that was derived from the ancestor that we all share. And I say we all because we're vertebrates, you know, we're included in that vertebrate group, right? All right, so one part of taxonomy is to name species. And Carolus Car uh, Linnaeus was the father of taxonomy. And he's the one that came up with the naming system. He came up with the classification system and he came up with the naming system. And that's why he's revered as the father of taxonomy. Um, so what we have here uh, lifted up, listed on the left are what we refer to as common names. 
and common names are insufficient. And the reason they're insufficient is because they vary. They vary by language, they vary by location. What we need is a system of naming that is used by, you know, in all languages and all over the planet so that everybody knows when you say um, Loxodonta cyclotus that you're referring to a pygmy elephant, right? But not everybody's going to call it a pygmy elephant, and that's the problem. So that's why we need scientific names. So since the 1700s, in other, in other words, since Car, uh, Carolus Linnaeus, the father of, of taxonomy, um, scientific names have been based on Greek and Latin roots, which basically most languages are uh, maybe even all. I'm not a linguist, so I don't even remember, but um, based on Greek and Latin roots. So if you're taking Latin, a lot of this can sound familiar to you. Um, so, for example, nasalis larvar, uh, larvatus, nasalis larvatus is the proboscis monkey. And nasalis, you know, your nose, nasal, nasal refers to nose. So that should sound familiar to you, uh, even if you don't take Latin. Um, so nasalis refers to nose and lar larvatus refers to mask. Because if you look at a proboscis monkey, which is what we're looking at right here, uh, it looks like he's wearing a mask, and that mask has a huge nose. So it's a monkey with a huge nose uh, that is almost comical looking, so much so that it's like he has a mask on. So that's the basis for the name. And, you know, when you learn Greek and Latin roots, it can be kind of fun to uh, translate these. So another one, just as an example here, the silver gibbon, hylobates, uh, Moloch means wood leaper king. And this is the silver gibbon here. Wood leaper because he can leap from branch to branch through the woods, right? And he's the king, king of the forest, leaping from branch to branch in the, fo in, in the woods. And then this one, um, Leo, Leontopithecus, Leontopithecus rosalia, lion ape red. That would be the golden lion tamarind here. All right. So that's how we name species. And it's known as binomial nomenclature. If you look at these uh, scientific names, they all have two names. And so that's referred to as binomial nomenclature. And again, this was developed by Carolus Linnaeus. Um, and what binomial nomenclature translates to is a two-name naming system binomial to name nomenclature means naming system. Um, so again, Carolus Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy, came up with this whole system and we still use it today and he came up with it back in the 1700s. So these all have at least two names um, and the first name is the genus. So I put genus up here referring to the first names and all these scientific names. The first names of the genus and um, it's always capitalized. So when you're writing scientific names, remember you want to capitalize the genus. Um, and note that when you type scientific names, you want to italicize them. So keep that in mind, like in your research project, when you're typing the scientific name of the species that you're working with, make sure you italicize it. The second name is the species name. And it's unique and often descriptive of that species, you know, like nose mask. And um, it's entirely up to the taxonomist to know what, uh, the, what the, the species name is going to be. So it can actually be based on a person, uh, the person who discovered it. So in other words, if you discover a species, you can name that species after yourself. It needs to be the same genus as closely related species, but the second name, the, the species name, can be your name. Um, and that way you'll go, you know, you'll live forever in the name, in the name of that species in the taxonomy system. Um, also note that it's not capitalized. So the second, the species name is not capitalized. So keep those rules in mind when you're writing species names. The genus is capitalized, the species is not, and the whole thing is italicized when you're typing it. Uh, so you'll notice that a few of these have three names, like for example, Panthera tigris tigris. Well, what's that all about? Well, th those are species that have subspecies. In other words, uh, you can think of these as almost like races, subspecies. 
a third name, um, and that would be a trinomial name, right? Not binomial, but trinomial. Um, it's used to denote a subspecies. It's also not capitalized, and a subspecies is a fairly permanent uh, geographically isolated race. So in other words, uh, tigers, there are different species of tigers that live in different regions, geographically isolated regions, and therefore they have diverged. They've uh, evolved away from each other. They've evolved to become different from each other. And so there are actually nine, uh, nine subspecies of tiger uh, living in various places in the world. Actually, I take that back. There are only six subspecies that are currently living that are extant because three of them are extinct already. And they're extinct because of human activity. And if we don't watch what we're doing, the other six are going to go extinct too. And one last note on that, um, there are actually more tiger species in captivity in the world than there are living in the wild right now, which is a sad state of affairs. All right, so again, Linnaeus came up with the classification system, and um, he came up with most of it. It's been modified. It's been modified uh, greatly since he came up with it. Um, but and so one of the major modifications is that when when he devised the system, he only had two kingdoms, plants and animals, and that was it. Plantae and animalia are the the kingdom names of those kingdoms. So, you know, you can say the plant kingdom, and you can say the animal kingdom. But I would prefer you use plantae when you're referring to the plant kingdom and animalia when you're referring to the animal kingdom. Uh, but anyway, he came up with kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And uh, hopefully that sounds familiar to you. Maybe you've learned about it before. And if you haven't, uh, I want you to ingrain this in your in your brain, and so that's why we're we're doing kind of a an oral quiz where I'm asking you to recite this as if you're going to remember it for the rest of your life without reading it, just recite it as if you're you've always known it and you're going to know it for the rest of your life. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Just say it like that. But actually, when you recite it, I'm asking you to recite it with two more. One being not on here, which is life, because, you know, life is being classified here. So life, it all starts with life. All life on earth is divided up into domains. Domains are divided up into kingdoms. Kingdoms are divided up into phylum. So what you re really want to recite is life, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And what I've classified here is us, homo sapiens, right? Um, and... So this is our classification. This is how we are classified. And this is also an example of how Linnaeus's initial system it has been modified. So we found that within the phylum chordata, we need to have subphylums because there are different groups within the phylum chordata that are different enough from each other that they can be separated out into three subphylums. Um, and vertebrata is just one of those three subphylums. And I put in parentheses here some of the characteristics that uh, are, are synapomorphies, I guess you could say, that, that these uh, different groups share. And of course, besides vertebrates, we're mammals, right? But we're in the subclass because there are different mammals. For example, there are egg-laying mammals like the echidna and the, and the platypus. And there are pouched mammals like kangaroos and, and koalas. And there are placental mammals, right? So there are subclasses of ma mammals. Um, and we're in the subclass theria. Then within that, there's an infraclass, eutheria, which means true mammals. Theria means mammals, eutheria means true mammals, because the placental mammals are the dominant mammals on the planet today. Um, and then we have the order primates, which we share with monkeys and uh, other apes. The suborder Anthropoidea, superfamily hominoidea and you know this is all basically uh, come out as we've discovered the fossil record and, and found our own ancestors living in the fossil record um, but also living species of, of primates and then the family hominidae which are the great apes uh, and so along with us then would be um, orangutans and gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos, bonobos in our own family and then we've got the genus Homo and species Sapiens. And these are bracketed because the genus and species together, as you know, is the scientific name. 
And notice I italicized them too, as you should, and the first one is capitalized and the second, second name is lowercase, homo sapiens. And on a side note, just to confuse things, and I don't mean to confuse you, but there are uh, different taxonomists will consider different taxonomical systems. An example of that is our own classification. There are some taxonomists that would say that we are a subspecies, that we are Homo sapiens sapiens, and that there is also Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, because the Neanderthals were so closely related to us. They're now extinct, of course, but... Uh, they're so closely related to us that they are they belong in our own species uh, and that we are a subspecies. So we would be Homo sapiens sapiens and they would be Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. But again, that's not accepted by all taxonomists. They would feel that uh, Neanderthals are Homo neanderthalensis instead of being a subspecies of sapiens. But anyway, life, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. All right, this is another representation of the same thing, uh, classifying uh, grizzly bears. Uh, but it gets across the idea that the classification system, life, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, is hierarchical. Um, so each taxa, that's what we refer to each level, is a taxa or a taxon. Um, and each each taxon includes species that share derived characters, that share synapomorphies, and they inher inherited those synapomorphies from a common ancestor. So you'll also notice that it's a hierarchical system, and all that means is that for every kingdom, there are, uh, within every kingdom there are a number of phylums, within every phylum there are a number of classes, within every class there's a number of orders, and so on. That's a hierarchical system. So uh, the higher the taxon, and again, each level is a taxon, the higher the taxon, the more inclusive it is. So in other words, look at all the different species that are included in the kingdom Animalia. And then as we go down to the phylum Chordata, there are fewer species that are included in the phylum Chordata. So it's more inclusive as you go up. It includes more species. Um, and also, as you go up, the ancestor of all these species in the kingdom Animalia lived a long time ago compared to the species that are included in the phylum Chordata or the species included in the class Mammalia. So as you go down, um, the species that are included in the taxa, the lower taxa, as we say, uh, are more closely related and the ancestor that they shared lived less time ago, uh, more recently, okay? So the lower the taxon, the more in exclusive, and the more recent the common ancestor. And just to try to uh, make that point more clear, um, let's go through the, the taxa. And I, I also indicate here how many of each taxon there is. So in other words, there are three domains. Eukarya is one of three domains. That's what I'm representing here with the slash three. Um, domain Eukarya is one out of the three domains. And then we have the kingdom Animalia, and uh, there are six kingdoms. So kingdom Animalia is one of the six kingdoms. And then we've got the phylum Chordata, which is one out of a, approximately 35. And again, the classification system kind of varies between, uh, you know, who you're talking to, but there are approximately 35 uh, phylums of uh, animals. So phylum chordata is just one of those 35. And then the class, uh, then we have the subphylum. And if you look on the previous slide, you'll notice that the classification system so far for the grizzly bear is equivalent to our own classification. And that's because grizzly bears are mammals, and so are we. So until we uh, start subdividing the mammals, we're not going to see a different classification than what we see for ourselves uh, on the previous slide. So subphylums in the, in the uh, phylum uh, vertebrata or we have subphylum vertebrata, and that's one subphylum of the three subphylums there are within um, the phylum chordata. And then we have the class mammalia, and that's one class out of seven. So there are seven classes of mammals. 
uh, I'm sorry, there are seven classes. Mammalia is one of those seven classes. Um, and they are seven classes of vertebrates, which um, involve three classes of fish, then uh, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Um, Oh, and reptiles. That, that didn't add up to six, so I knew I was missing one. So again, it's three classes of fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Seven classes. So if you'll recall from the previous slide, there we've got the subclass Theria, and there are two subclasses. And again, this varies depending on the taxonomist you're talking to, but Theria is one of two subclasses. And then there's the infraclass Eutheria, the true mammals, which are the placental mammals. And again, there are two infraclasses uh, within the subclass Theria. Um, and that would be represented by the pouch mammals, in other words, the marsupials and ourselves. Um, those are the two infraclasses. Then we've got the order Carnivora. Um, and this is where we branch off because our order is primates and grizzly bears are in the order Carnivora. And there are 17 orders um, carnivora is just one of 17 orders. And then we've got the family Ursidae, which are bears. Um, and Ursidae is just one family of 15 families of bears. And then we've got the genus Ursus. And there are five, uh, the, uh, five genuses of bears. So the, uh, Ursus is just one genus of five genuses. And then we have, uh, the grizzly bear which is the species name is Ursus arctos. And notice it's in, in italics. Um, and there are four uh, Ursus arctos. Grizzly bears are just one of four species within the genus Ursus. So I'm not expecting you to know all of that. All I wanted to do was illustrate this whole idea that within every domain, there are a number of kingdoms. And within every kingdom, there are a number of phylums and, and so on. The hierarchical nature of the system. Like I said, I spent a lot of time with this slide, so I even added numbers of species uh, for each taxon. So when it comes to domain eukarya, if you'll recall that 8.7 million estimate uh, that was on the, on the first slide of this unit, uh, that's an estimate of only the eukaryotes on the planet. So about 8.7 million eukaryotes. Of those, about 7.7 .7 million are animals. And of those, about 70,000 are chordates, and most of the chordates are vertebrates, so 65,000 are vertebrates. And then mammals, there are about 6,000 mammals. Notice that there's a squiggly in front of these because these are approximations. I rounded, in other words, um, and we don't know exactly either because we haven't found them all. And then there are approximately um, 6,000 in the subclass Theria. Uh, and again, that's an approximation, so that's why they're the same. And then the infraclass Eutheria, about 5,650 species. And then we get down to the order Carnivora, and there are about 300 species of carnivores, eight uh, species in the family Ursidae, four species in the genus Ursus, and th these are the four right here, so these numbers are the same. And then one species that is actually Ursus arctos, right? So I just wanted to uh, show how the number of species relates to the levels of taxon also. That's an example or an illustration of how, uh, as you go down in taxa, the, uh, they become more exclusive, more inclusive as you go up, more exclusive as you go down. And if that wasn't enough, I wanted to speak to this whole idea of it's more ancient as you go up and more recent as you go down. So I added times onto the diagram. So the domain Eukarya appeared on the planet about 2 billion years ago. In other words, that's the, the whole era, uh, theory of endosymbiosis, where mitochondria and chloroplasts came from. Um, so that happened about 2 billion years ago. Then the first animals about 1 billion years ago, and this is a, a big approximation. It's somewhere between 600 million and, and 1 billion years ago. And then we've got uh, Phylum chordata, which uh, in the Cambrian chordates appeared in the Cambrian, which is about 500 million years ago. So notice we've gone from billion to millions now. And then we've got 
the class mammalia, which diverged or, or evolved, uh, or there's common ancestry between mammals and, and reptiles. Um, so they diverged about 250 million years ago. And then the order carnivora about 42 million years ago. And the family Ursidae branched off about 38 million years ago. And the genus Ursus diverged about 15 million years ago. And then finally, oops, back we go. Um, and that divergence included the, uh, the speciation of the grizzly bear. So that was 15 million years ago also. So again, more ancient, or I'm sorry, more recent as you go down and more ancient as you go up. And I sure made a mess of that slide, didn't I?